Welcome to OFFA Studio. My guest for today is Priyanshu Kumar. Priyanshu leads clean water. They are into uh, restoration and beautification of water bodies. Priyanshu, how do you go about it? How do you do that? It's simple. Uh, we just go about fixing the water quality and mm -hmm. everything else falls into place. Uh, so if you have, uh, if, if a certain water body is polluted and you improve the water quality and make it, uh, make the water quality great, then the fish and the entire ecology biodiversity can survive. Hmm. Uh, the same clean water would leach into the ground yeah. and uh, no health hazards. Uh, you would like to go and visit that lake. So all of the problems get solved, most of them at least, if you solve the problem of uh, water quality. But that's just one problem, which is water quality. Yeah. Let, let's start with all the problems that you and we as a human race face as a whole. Right? Like, you know, I, I, I just want to uh, zoom out a bit and right. try to understand like this. Although it, within the sustainability space, what are some key things that people should go after? Sure. So, um... The problem with water bodies today are multidimensional. Okay. Uh, you kind of have to see it through the lens of how they've evolved over time mm -hmm. uh, to get a complete picture. Yeah. So I think one of the major problems today with water bodies is they've been encroached. Okay. And uh, kind of some of them are becoming dead. Mm -hmm. Some are completely vanishing altogether. For example, a lot of lakes have been filled up, yeah. made land and uh, maybe resident, residential development has been done yeah. on top of them. Uh, the channels that used to uh, run into these lakes now are either blocked or they sometimes cause floods mm -hmm. during heavy rains. Uh, the water bodies that have, let's say, not been made land of till now, till now uh, they're constantly facing encroachment. Right. Uh, so at uh, Indian lakes, we see people uh, filling a certain filling up a certain part of the lake, right. making it land, uh, approaching further yeah. and kind of a salami slicing technique like yeah. China. Yeah. So a lot of water bodies have been filled up. Mm. Uh, they kind of been encroached from all sides. Mm. Uh, the channels that kind of used to lead into these lakes uh, are kind of completely filled up. So the lakes normally these days do not fill up. Even if they do, yeah. uh, they dry up within six to eight months. And during the peak summers, mm. these lakes are generally dry. Yeah. Um, and uh, with encroachment, the problem is there's a lot of problem of solid waste coming into right. uh, these water bodies, untreated sewage, chemical effluents, all kinds of wastewater coming into these water bodies, polluting it. Uh, I see it in two different uh, categories. Um, I see it as a problem of water scarcity and water pollution. Uh, so when let's say a lake does not fill up, the groundwater does not get recharged. Um, there's no water left for ecology, fishes, they die. Um, water bodies also regulate the temperature of a urban area. Hmm. Uh, the lesser uh, area they cover, uh, the more temperature variations would be. Right. So the extremes would be higher. Um, so there's this entire problem of water scarcity. Hmm. Um, we're running out of groundwater. So for example, in Bangalore, there's no groundwater even at uh, 1200 feet. Oh, wow. Uh, forty percent of Bangalore's population is completely dependent on tankers. Imagine that. Yeah. Forty percent, and with this this year, uh, with El Nino expected and less than average rainfall, uh, I'm ser seriously hoping for Bangalore. So Bangalore has kind of uh, been instrumental in drying out Kaveri and kind of gets a major share of Kaveri's water. Yeah. Um, 40%, the rest of them are dependent on tankers, right? But let's say if a certain year, you just get 60, 70% of the rainfall. The groundwater does not get recharged. The lakes do, do not get filled up. Um, the water in Kaveri, um, this year, particularly with El Nino is expected to be lower. Hmm. So every water source that you had suddenly, let's say just went down by 60, 70%. How do you manage for the entire year? My God. The government might send in a few trains loaded with water, but Bangalore does not have a population of 10,000 or 1 lakh people, right? Yeah. Uh, trains could not really bring that quantum of water sustainably. Yeah. What do you do then? Uh, obviously, people can't live without water. So the logical thing I see happening this year is migrations. Hmm. Uh, maybe they'll start in small amounts and temporary migrations. For example, 
three lakh, ten lakh people might migrate just for those three, four summer months. Mm. Might come back again in the city for work after monsoons. Mm. Um, but some people will kind of start migrating permanently. Um, this is and this would cause huge economic losses for the country as well. Right. And this is why this needs to be catered uh, very uh, quickly on a war, war footing. Um, so we're talking today uh, in the month of September in 2023 and we're in the midst of the monsoons. Uh, but I think we should be preparing for rainwater harvesting for the next monsoons right away. I think the si- situation is so urgent. How, how much like, you know, compared to the usual, how much water have we received uh, in this monsoon? Like the rainfall, is it is it close to, I mean, the, the usual, is it more than average? Is it, was it less? How much is it? So it's a random pattern. Um, overall for the entire monsoons, uh, we are at a deficit, Mm -hmm. um, somewhere in the tune of 10 to 15%. Okay. Um, and month on month variation is something that, uh, needs to be looked at as well. For example, you grow crops, you plant these crops at a certain time of the year expecting rain. Um, and if, so that variance in the rainfall uh, has kind of been observed. For example, in 2023, in August month alone, Bangalore just received about 10 to 20 percent of the August average August uh, rainfall for the past let's say 10, 20 years. Mm-hmm. Just 10 to 20 percent of average of the past 10 years. Mm-hmm. So those kind of variations, maybe then there might be uh, a heavy downpour someday, yeah, and uh, might break the records of. Uh, down for in a single day there would be floods yeah so you we still might hear uh cases of flooding in bangalore and other every urban city for that matter and drought in the coming months right that's so that excess water where does that go it just runs away we're mm-hmm. living in concrete jungles it does not go into the ground anymore mm-hmm. this ground cannot absorb it and neither do we uh, set up are doing enough work for rainwater harvesting and putting this into the ground. Yeah. So it flows away as quickly as it falls in concrete jungles. Okay. And how, how do you tackle that problem at clean water? Do you do that or are you only into beautification? So uh, we are into uh, water body rejuvenation, uh, particularly from the lens of water pollution mm-hmm. and improving water quality. Got it. Um, you see, uh, solving these problems of opening up the channels, making rain uh, water harvesting, etc., is uh, completely government dependent and a, a little problematic as well. For example, uh, any private entity, let's say a builder, hmm. uh, would have encroached on the land which might belong to the nala or the channel leading to the lake. Uh, now the government needs to open this. Yeah. So it's a matter of encroachment removal and then just digging up the channel again etc right but the first thing that needs to happen is removing of these uh encroachments and that's where things are stuck in most of the urban centers in india um because let's say um in a city like indore if a certain rule has to be enforced that let's say 30 meters on both sides of the river Mm. um, have to be left vacant as green buffer zone yeah i estimate that about 50,000 to 1 lakh people would have to be displaced from their homes. Hmm. And some of these establish, some of these establishments actually predate the concept of modern India, right? They might be 200, 500 years old. Yeah. And now calling them encroachment, giving them little to no compensation and asking them to be relocated at yeah. such a uh, huge quantum does yeah. not seem possible in India. Right. And more so from the perspective of vote banks. Yeah. These people do not want to move. The local leader would come in and maybe uh, get a stay on this. So that's where we are stuck, particularly. Well, I, what, what are some other challenges that you face apart from this? Another challenge right now is uh, uh, like wo- the entire uh, working with the government bit. Uh, it includes everything. For example, uh, the budgets for water body restoration have just started coming in in the past year or two. Uh, before that, Uh, And particularly during COVID, uh, water body rejuvenation used to get very minimal budget because the money was diverted towards COVID relief efforts. So the budget is first. Uh, But the major thing I, uh, in my opinion, is political will. Um, Water body rejuvenation is not a matter that gets you votes and wins elections. Uh, So it's not been 
kind of driven from top bottom the bureaucrats might still comply if uh the leaders of the country want to kind of get water right. body rejuvenation done so i think that's one area where this is stuck um and let's say uh, the other problem is uh the bureaucracy either does not have any incentive to solve the problem yeah yeah that's what i thought um what i mean by that is uh, i remember about 15 20 years back uh people always used to uh, the contractors always used to build sub quality sub standard roads the reason uh, they so did that, that they could do it again they can do it again yeah. right yeah. um similarly i think this been a uh, sector in its nascent stage i think it's similar games have been played right now mm-hmm. and uh, another thing is prioritization for example the budgets that are coming in for water bodies are kind of uh, diverted or maybe used uh for lesser priority things uh what i mean by that is let's say for example if a certain amount of fund came in for water body <clears throat> the first thing um people generally do at a water body is do the fencing yeah uh diesel the lake mm. uh, make a good uh, walkway around it put benches lights plant trees etc right but nobody's focusing on water quality you're working yeah. at a lake the first and foremost thing you should be doing is looking at the water quality right uh but uh the funds that are coming in are kind of directed towards these basic civil works um uh, and often uh through the channel of the established contractors of the government that have been kind of working with the government for uh, certain years yeah so uh the things that need to be prioritized like encroachment removal focusing on water quality are taking a back seat while these funds are being kind of uh channel towards things that could have been done later obviously we need to make a boundary wall as well but uh, there are certain things that should have been done first got it how are uh, how are people in developed countries tackling these issues because they might all, they must also face these right so how is it tackled over there how is it done differently over there um so every uh, country tackles it differently so most of the developing nations let's say um, southeast asia uh, and other places are facing problems similar to india okay in terms of water body rejuvenation where they can't really put a check on the wastewater entering these water bodies uh untreated wastewater and then uh, the water body could is really really hard to kind of treat the water within the lake yeah uh, but that's what we do but uh, at uh, in uh, most of the countries the basic uh, template that's been followed is don't let the wa- waste water come into the water bodies right. set up a treatment plant before it uh, and only the treated water uh, could be kind of then let into the water body so you maintain water quality of that uh, place and this has to be enforced uh, without any exceptions so for example uh, for, for example in india when uh, there's let's say an encroachment drive happening near water bodies uh, a lot of the drain pipes that previously uh, led into these water bodies are often not removed yeah um, because contour plays a very important role here as well for example river generally flows at the lowest point of a contour right uh, but let's say something just above this somebody on the slopes um uh, their sewage or wastewater can't travel against gravity and in the upper direction right it has to eventually land into the river yeah. or the lowest point and uh how do you stop that you can't really pump sewage from every household right um uh, so you, you to kind of tap this nala entering the water body maybe have a pipeline going parallelly or inside the river to a downstream location where you have a treatment plant you treat it and only then does the water enter the main river got it that's a makeshift solution a better design could have been uh, had our cities been planned according to contours and water but uh, yeah, the urban sprawl yeah. it's too late for that and yeah urban sprawl has grown uncontrollably all right so you spoke about sewage treatment plants right so they they have a large volume of water that is being treated over there do you work in beautification and uh, like purification of those as well can your solution be implemented there yeah so we okay. used to build sewage treatment plants so mm-hmm. um have stopped doing that okay um so we can build sewage treatment plants but uh, right now it's done more on a centralized level Mm-hmm. uh for example um 
10% of a city's load coming to one particular treatment plant or 30-40% of a city's load coming to a treatment, a single treatment plant. Uh, and then the quantum becomes huge. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other approach is decentralized wastewater treatment plants. Let's say every colony, every hotel, hospital, industry, educational institute has their own treatment plant. Uh, there, are, there are pros and cons of both. Um, a centralized approach is more cost effective in terms yeah. of uh, treatment but uh, given how pipelines are laid in India uh, the wastewater never reaches the treatment plant in the first place yeah. uh, even if it does it often goes uh, improper or uh, incomplete treatment mm -hmm. um, because often corners are cut yeah. to uh, reduce the uh, reduce maintenance cost mm -hmm. and even if it's treated well, the technologies that have been uh, kind of uh, set up on, they finally dose chlorine into the water before releasing this treated yeah. water into the water body. Mm -hmm. So the water would be clean and free of germs, but this chlorine won't let the fishes li live either. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that's another problem. Um, but on a decentralized uh, manner, if you set up treatment plants, you could kind of reuse the water there and then. Yeah, so another problem with centralized approaches, let's say if all of the water of a city went downstream and got treated at this centralized one single treatment plant, yeah. how do you reuse this water? Hmm. You will have to pump it against pump the back gravity back into yeah. the city and have another distribution network maybe of just this treated water. Um, and so it's a complex infrastructure to manage. Whereas let's say if you had a let's say of 10 acre educational campus, let's say hmm. uh, you treated your water within your campus and then you use the uh, treated water for your lawns, gardening, um, car wash, flushing, etc. Yeah. So that could be a really great approach, but uh, the cost of treating water per liter is slightly higher in decentralized systems, economies of scale. Um, plus it puts the onus on the private uh, entity which really does not want to do it because it's a cost center for them, right? Yeah. Um, setting up a sewage treatment plant or wastewater treatment plant has a good enough capex. Yeah. And in order to keep it running, there's an opex cost annually. Right. Uh, so generally builders do build treatment plants, but once it's kind of hand over, handed over to the society of people, yeah. people don't really maintain it because yeah. Uh, yeah. of the high maintenance costs. So that's the problem where we're at. Okay. How does it all work? Like, how is the process? Uh, uh, how does the whole process of you purifying and beautifying lakes work? Got it. Um, so, we are kind of uh, focusing on water quality in lakes mm. and looking at each pollutant individually. Okay. Uh, so, in a lake, anything except H2O is a pollutant. It could be nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. It could be heavy metals, arsenic, lead, zinc etc. It could be biological, organic okay. material. It could be chemicals. Hmm. Uh, it could be anything else. Uh, so all of these pollutants need to be catered to, hmm. to kind of completely rejuvenate a water body. Hmm. Uh, for example, um, let's talk about nutrients. Yeah. Uh, there's, uh, during monsoons, uh, the water coming into a lake dissolves all of the nutrients pre present on the land and brings it to the lake, causing eutrophication. Like, in simple words, are overdose of nutrients. Yeah. Now, algae or water hyacinth or similar invasive species uh, have air and water. Now they have food in the form of nutrients. So they eat up this food, multiply and cover the entire surface of the lake. Right. right. Uh, so how do you stop them? Remove the nutrients. They won't multiply. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that's what we do. So we put in floating wetlands and bacteria, which pull up all of these nutrients so that there's none left for algae, water hyacinth, duckweed. And they eventually starve and do not multiply. That's smart. Yeah. So it's a nature-based solution as well. You're applying wetlands and naturally present friendly bacteria to do that. So that's how we kind of, let's say, cater to nutrients. Uh, what are these floating yeah. islands made of? Uh, so we made islands of different materials. Uh, till date, wood, metal, FRP, aluminium. What's FRP? Uh, it's fiber reinforced polymer. Okay. So, uh, the thing is, wooden islands uh, generally are the cheapest, mm -hmm. but wood eventually rots in water yeah. uh, and even metal corrodes in water. So, they have a less, let's say a lesser lifetime of about three year, greater than three years, greater than five years. Mm -hmm. But if you want your product to be sustainable and last for 10 years, 25 years or longer, uh, you need to eventually come to polymers. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so we are, are they more expensive than the metal and wood counterparts? About 10 to 10 to 20 percent okay. higher. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we're trying. How we kind of cater into that is why don't we make these islands of recycled plastic? Right. We have a lot of plastic trash yes, already. Yeah. Why don't we recycle them and make them into islands? Hmm. Um, and so that's one uh, direction we're heading towards. But for now, we've tried with different materials, and that's let's say North Pole metric for us of making islands completely of recycled plastic and completely sustainable nice what's on the island like what kind of uh, are there plants or do you go full-blown trees is it grass what is it so trees could be planted as well but given the weight uh, weight of trees we really don't put in trees right now uh, what, what can the uh, the floating body support what kind of weight can it support so for example one island um, let's say that we make is to, uh, the most selling island is two meters by two meters, roughly the size of a double bed yeah, and, okay. and about uh, one and a half feet in height. Mm -hmm. uh, this island when manufactured weighs about 200 kgs. Mm -hmm. When it's installed on the water body with plants and uh, cocoa peat and everything, it goes to 400, 500 kgs. Plants and what? Uh, cocoa peat. So we really don't put in soil and uh, manure. Okay. We just, uh, we use an alternate planting mix, which is cocoa peat because it's lighter and it holds more water. Okay. Okay. Um, so with all of this setup, it goes up to 400, 500 kgs and wow. it's designed for 800 kgs. So maybe multiple people can still stand on top and keep floating. Wow. Uh, so we're designing islands so that they could be used for rivers as well. Lakes mm. really don't get that turbulent waters, but imagine a river at the peak of the monsoon with those roaring currents. Uh, our island should kind of survive, uh, comfortably survive in the, those conditions as well. So these islands, yeah. like, do, do they float freely on water or are they stuck to the river so, bed? Or the... Uh, we anchor them through ropes or chains. Okay, they're anchored. Yeah. yeah. So these they are floating. They could kind of drift away hmm. uh, depending on which way the wind is blowing, etc. Yeah. So they need to be tied to a rope. Hmm. And this rope then could be tied to a concrete block at the bottom of the lake nice. or to a pole or a tree on the side of the lake. Hmm. So uh, depending on the water body, you could anchor it differently. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. So and the purpose of these wetlands, hmm. floating islands or floating wetlands is to pull up these nutrients that we were discussing. Right. Uh, not just nutrients, they actually pull up heavy metals as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and the roots of these plants uh, eventually go down into the water. Hmm. Uh, friendly bacteria come and attach to these. Uh, what, what are friendly and non-friendly bacteria? Uh, so... What I mean by friendly is uh, any bacteria that's aiding the water treatment process is friendly. Got it. Mm -hmm. And any uh, bacteria or E. coli, which is which yeah. might cause harm to humans or any health hazard, mm -hmm. are not friendly. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, so you say like the roots go down, they pull up all the nutrients. Nutrients, they pull up the heavy metals. They also support uh, bacterial colonies by giving surface area. We also add a certain material called biomedia underneath the islands, mm -hmm. uh, which gives immense surface area. So then together, these plants and the bacteria uh, uptake uh, heavy metals, nutrients. They also remove BOD, COD, other. BOD, COD. BOD and COD are biological oxygen demand mm -hmm. and chemical oxygen demand. Uh, which essentially means what is the biological load and the chemical load uh, okay. in the water and how much oxygen is kind of required to completely treat these. Okay. And what kind of uh, plants go on top of these islands? Uh, these are plants generally found in wetland areas. Okay. Uh, in and around lake, rivers, etc. The distinguishing feature of these plants is even if their roots are completely submerged in water all the time, they can still survive and thrive. Yeah. For example, a rose plant might die because of rotting of the roots, but these plants can uh, thrive even if their roots are completely submerged in water all the time. Okay. What are like you know you just mentioned that the floating body of the island the size is the size of a double bed. So uh, till date we have made more than seventeen different types of islands. Wow. Uh, right from the smallest one feet by one feet mm -hmm. to the biggest. Uh, one measuring about 80 to 85 square feet, mm -hmm. um, one meter by one meter, 1 1.2 by 1 1.2 square, rectangular, circular, islands of, like I said, wood, metal, aluminum, by metal, I mean MS, aluminum, yeah. FRP, uh, and different buy -NCs, different end cases. Some yeah. were purely for beautification, some were for water treatment, some were for ecological restoration. Yeah. Uh, so though the end purpose might vary, uh, but a single wetland actually provides all the three benefits. Got it. Got it. How, how did you get this idea? 
So uh, I got borrowed this idea from uh, what we used to do uh, by building sewage treatment plants. Okay. So in a certain technology in uh, a sewage treatment plant, uh, these wetland See, plants you were used to do as in like you know just just let's just back up for a bit over here. Yeah. How, how did you start? What, what did you start with? What was your first job? Um, so uh, at Clean Water, we started back in 2016, 17. Maybe you. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I uh, like I am a civil engineer by okay. education. So I uh, did my B Tech in civil from IIT Bombay, 2008 to 12. Mm -hmm. uh, worked with a couple of civil engineering real estate companies during college. Uh, but post-college, I joined Godrej Properties first mm -hmm. uh, as a civil engineer. Quickly, I realized that a civil engineering career is not rewarding. But if you're on the other side of the table, working from the perspective of real estate, things yeah. are much better. Yeah. Uh, so I joined a real estate consulting firm as an analyst. Uh, the firm was called Isis for us. Uh, before moving on to a startup called housing.com, which was, I think, uh, yeah. which is a pretty well-known startup and yeah. the flag bearer of that startup wave. <laughs> yeah. yeah true. Uh, so I was part of CEO's office at housing as well. Mm -hmm. uh, after housing, I'd got the confidence that, hey, even I can start an organization myself. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to solve a major social problem as well. Uh, thought about energy, thought about solid waste. What's energy? Energy, by energy, any electricity, energy, batteries, um, power, yeah, okay, uh, solar, wind, uh, that dimension. So thought about energy, thought about solid waste, but both these sectors were kind of uh, very capital in intensive, right. and your success was directly proportional to the depth of your pocket. If you started with hundred crores or ten thousand crores, your success would com be completely dependent on that, which wasn't the case with water. Um, because, uh, we started with building sewage treatment plants, mm -hmm. um, for, uh, decentralized players like builders, building new colonies, townships, hotels, hospitals. Uh, the first client gave us a good advance. It was a consulting project and that got us, that got the ball rolling. So we, uh, got few more clients on board, started building sewage treatment plants for private and government clients, uh, different, uh, sizes, uh, hospitals, marriage gardens, industries, colonies. Uh, we delivered over 30 such treatment plants mm -hmm. uh, before realizing that uh, a product-based business model would be far more scalable yeah. compared to services and that nobody's into restoring water bodies. The sector yeah. of setting up STPs is very competitive mm -hmm. um, and very kind of dependent and controlled by the Pollution Control Board. Because they are the ones who will finally give the NOC. Uh, but nobody is into re rejuvenating water bodies mm. right now. And this was about four to five years back. Mm. Uh, and why not make a product mm. to uh, solve the problems of water bodies? Some of the constraint at water bodies is there's often no space available around water bodies due to encroachment. Right. So you need a in C2 kind of solution. A solution if it can float on the water, that's great, right? It won't really need an additional area, which is not there. Uh, it has to be nature-based hmm. solution. It has to be sustainable, low O&M, uh, etc. And so that's when we kind of picked up a concept uh, of how wetlands clean the water. And they're often being utilized in certain sewage treatment plants as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we picked up that concept, made floating platforms, made uh, floating products, uh, and uh, started kind of installing them on lakes and monitoring results. Uh, measuring plant growth, root growth, etc. And that's how we have kind of evolved over time, making different types of islands and uh, doing complete lake rejuvenation as well. So mm -hmm. making islands is one bit, but transforming a certain lake from completely green or brown water to clean and clear water with great ecology thriving, people wanting to come to that water body. Yes. Uh, so that's how we've kind of uh, evolved over time. And that's how we kind of landed with the floating wetlands concept. Got it. So who, who are your customers now? Uh, governments and uh, CSR funds. CSR so, funds. So the budget for water body restoration right now is coming only through two sources. Uh, one is obviously the government. Government owns most of the water bodies. Yeah. And uh, the second source is CSR funds. Hmm. Uh, so they are our primary clients. Uh, either we kind of associate with the corporates with CSR funds directly hmm. or often certain NGOs um, kind of take certain part 
uh, of the lake restoration process. For example, a local NGO could come in and uh, do a solid waste cleanliness or gra- garbage collection drive, right. tea pl- tree plantation drive. Right? So we like to collaborate with NGOs as well. So how how are the two different? Like you know, working with the corporates and the government. Like how how are the two models different for you? So uh, they're two different worlds. Uh, working That's with the, you, yeah. Yeah. so working with the corporates is far easier. Uh-huh. Uh, approaching them by shooting an email, reaching out on LinkedIn, yeah. um, and having a conversation, giving them a presentation. Uh, standard what stuff. we do, yeah. uh, standard B two B sales cycle. But working with the governments is a different dynamic altogether. Uh, and in the case of most urban uh, polluted water bodies, government is the owner. Uh, so how we generally then kind of deal with them is either uh, we like to keep an entity between us and the government. Mm-hmm. For example, uh, often a contractor is taking care of the entire work at a lake, which includes all of the civil works and installation of our products as well. Yeah. So we build the contractor who then kind of supplies it to the government. Got it. Uh, think of this as either a contractor hmm. or a distributor. Hmm. So the business model that we want to kind of follow with the government is like a distributor approach similar to pump manufacturers like Kiloskar. Got it. So for example, Kiloskar makes pumps, right? 1 HP, 5 HP, 10 HP. Does not go and uh, fill in every tender, right? It, it has its distributor network. It sticks to manufacturing, gives the products to the uh, distributor. So then uh, go and supply through tenders, right? That's the model we want to uh, follow as well. Uh, so that we can kind of reach multiple uh, government departments, geographies uh, simultaneously. And also u- utilize the existing network that uh, exists. Hmm. Uh, plus, we would ri- ideally not like to be associated directly with the government. Hmm. Uh, it has its own different dynamics. So we're kind of trying to stick to B2B mm-hmm. uh, and also kind of looking to innovate on new business models. Right. Uh, so we've come up with a, a reven- RAS model, revenue as a re- restoration as a service, service. model. Mm-hmm. Um, could be alternatively called a PPP, public-private partnership. So uh, you might have seen with highways, when government wants to build highways, does not have the money, uh, it invites a private contractor to come in, yeah. put money from his own pocket, Build the highway, collect uh, tolls, collect tolls, recover the investment yeah. in a certain period of years. Imagine we could do something similar for water bodies. Yeah. So what our value proposition to the government is, look here, uh, you want to restore water bodies, don't have the expertise, don't have the budget, no problem. We will come in with the expertise and the budget and uh, put the entire capex and opex for restoring and maintaining these water bodies in the coming years. But in order to recover our investment, we'll generate revenue from water bodies through boating, fishing, uh, tourism, advertisements facing the main road, maybe a nursery on the dry part of the lake. Uh, So that's a business model that we're kind of looking to pilot as well and uh, go towards too. Um, And this is a win-win for the government as well because now they really don't have to spend a budget restoring the lake. And on the contrary, now... uh, we will give them revenue. Like yeah. the problem is getting solved without them putting in the budget. And on the contrary, they're getting revenue. Couldn't yeah. be better for them, right? Yeah, yeah. But the real world does not work. This way. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to communicate that to... Uh... It's not about the communication. It's about the incentive of the stakeholders. Correct. Um, if, but in this case, if they're yeah. actually making money off of the whole thing, they, then they are incentivized to an extent, right? Um. So if a private entity like ours Mm -hmm. comes in and restores the water body, uh, uh, we like, we'll do it. uh, What let's, but compare this uh, with the structure where they kind of take out tenders, Mm -hmm. where they publish tenders to get the work done. Yeah. Imagine this from the bureaucratic standpoint. Yeah. They would want tenders to go out. uh, Yeah. Because the entire system kind of is dependent on that. Yeah. Right. So even though this model would be completely meritorious uh, with every stakeholder benefiting like the government, ecology, uh, the creating new jobs, hmm. everything, but uh, it it is facing a few roadblocks currently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what else would you want to venture in uh, if if not cleaning water? I, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that you would want to be in the sustainability space. Oh, definitely. There's no better workspace than water bodies, believe me. Okay. Let's, let's, okay. 
let's uh, think of something other than water bodies would yeah. you uh, would you ever focus your attention on another problem that needs to be solved yeah so uh, before i we kind of venture out of water bodies there's another great problem that could be solved or a great uh, optimization that could be done is uh, floating farming so oh. hmm. so uh, the indian government for the first time just a few months back has published the water body census hmm. for the first time in india's history we now know that there are 24 lakh stagnant water bodies in india only the lakes ponds tanks reservoirs stagnant water bodies are 24 lakh hmm. plus river streams etc uh now 97% of this is in rural areas oh. only 3% is in urban areas and another astonishing fact at least to me was 50% of them are privately owned only 50% are government owned so you think of the market for example people have their own personal ponds along with their farms in rural areas so you might have uh, a half acre pond or whatever uh, size pond in along with your farm mm. and this you resource is currently getting uh, underutilized for example they store water so that they could use it for the uh, summer crop right yeah uh, but this water starts evaporating yeah uh, what if a certain crop could be grown on top of this uh, maybe a wetland plant like vetiver grass hmm. so that it covers the surface the evaporation reduces mm-hmm. it cleans the water so the fish yield from that pond increases by 2 to 5 times wow. so the farmer gains from the increased income from fish yield plus he has another crop growing on top of it yeah uh, for example at vetiver grass the roots could be harvested to make oil the mm. shoots could be harvested to make uh, fuel or um, fiber fibers yeah um so additional income for this and uh, this would also ensure that the methane emissions from the water body are reduced so this is one dimension that uh, very few people actually think about is the greenhouse ga- uh, gas emissions or methane emissions from water bodies hmm. so you see uh, whenever wastewater enters into a water body the sludge or the solid part goes and settles to the bottom part of the lake right and often the oxygen is getting transferred only on the surface of the water body and it does not reach the, the depths yeah. of uh, if the depth is 10 15 20 feet the oxygen just does not reach the bottom part hmm. so the organic matter that went and collected there uh, now starts giving out methane had it been aerated maybe co2 would have been generated methane is 22 times more harmful uh, so uh, there's a lot of greenhouse gas emissions coming from water bodies as well uh, that could be solved if you aerate the water body as well uh, blue credits or carbon credits are out there to be generated as well so that's also one area what are those so um, carbon credits uh, is at least uh, kind of fairly known blue credits are just uh, 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 water credits let's say um it's for uh, let's say if you can uh, right now water credits are for water conservation if you can kind of uh, store more water or put it in the ground and conserve more water right now water or blue credits are for that uh, but eventually uh, like but if there are methane emissions from a water body that you can measure and reduce you can cater to the carbon, current carbon credits as well carbon, carbon. So, um, and that's another emerging field uh, in the water body uh, space that people can look to target yeah and but we personally are looking to get into floating farming mm-hmm. because uh, this really impacts uh, the entire nation or the globe right for example imagine every farm in india that has a pond has either lotus growing on top of it or uh, water chestnut or singara mm. or lilies or flowers that that are supplied to the local market yeah. or uh, any other plant uh, that has like brahmi that has medicinal value uh, this would increase the farmers income yeah. create jobs reduce greenhouse gas emissions clean the water increase fish yield uh, it's a win win so we kind of looking to get into that uh, sector as well but still early days for us there yeah. so even if i was to, like were to think of moving away from water bodies i think i'd still stay in the sustainability space um and uh, so engineering solutions right. for what right now what we have started with is building technology and body restoration so right. we build wetlands now we've 
uh, added aerators, bacterial solutions to our product offering as well. And once this tech engineering bit is kind of solved, uh, I'd still like to kind of stay in this sector and solve the other problems or the roadblocks uh, that are in the way. For example, what I see one of the major roadblocks is uh, in this sector is the government hmm. and the policy bit working with them uh, the entire bit. Yeah. Um, anything in the sustainability space, be it air, water, solid waste, energy, uh, cannot be solved without the intervention of the government. Yeah. So, so you have to kind of deal with the government to solve any problem in any of these sectors. Uh, and I think that's one area that re requires the maximum improvement. So like us, there are other technology providers as well. And so the technology solutions are there. Um, even if not on the ground, they're still in the lab. They could still be uh, readily implemented on the ground and scaled. Hmm. Uh, but what really needs to be solved for is uh, at the government end, in, uh, in terms of creating the right policy, uh, bringing the right amount of budgets, uh, following the right kind of business models. Uh, government should really be going into PPP models rather than just spending money on rejuvenating water bodies. Right. Uh, so a lot of work needs to be done in this front. Uh, a lot of this would have to be pushed in through judicial bodies as well. Mm -hmm. For example, solving the encroachment bit mm -hmm. is really tricky. Yeah. Government by itself uh, might not do it unless judicial pressure or a environmental disaster happens. Yeah, yeah. Only and only then would the government wake up and start solving these problems. And I think that would be too late. Yeah. Uh, so I think that needs to be solved. Uh, things on the government front. So let me ask you a quick question there, Angad. Mm -hmm. uh, so the government identified about 24 lakh stagnant water bodies in India. Mm -hmm. Just the lakes, ponds, tanks, reservoir. 24 yeah. lakh yeah. rural urban mm -hmm. combined in India. Okay. How many of those do you think are encroached? They could be 1% encroached or 99% encroached. But I out of these 24 lakhs... I would think probably like 10 lakhs or like 40%. Uh, no, you're way off. So the ex the number as per the official government data is huh. just 1.6 percent. That's wrong. <laughs> that's clearly <laughs> you <laughs> both know that, but at least that's the official government data for now. And the, this was the first version of water body census, hmm. the first time ever in India's uh, history that we've come up with such a census. Hmm. The uh, numbers are definitely fudged up. 1.6 percent can't be that low. Yeah. Uh, so I think these are the things that need to be improved. For example, uh, this data is the first step that was required. I mm. think it's a great step that the government has done this. Yeah. And now we need to build on this. So now we know there are 24 lakh water bodies. How many of them are encroached and how many are not? What's the geo coordinate? How big are them? Yeah. So let's say if you have, even if you have identified 1.6% uh, to be encroached, let's make that list, give it to every state government, every city, and tell them, please get these encroachments removed in the next six months, one year, right? You could break down this problem right. now, now that you have data. Hmm. So I think uh, those things need to happen as well. But uh, removing encroachment uh, would require coordination from the judiciary, asking the local bureaucracy to do it. Uh, maybe the political will might try to stop. Uh, people from getting displaced but right. you still have to push through it because otherwise the water bodies can't really get restored right yeah uh, so i think i'll kind of stay in this sector even let's say not just if related to water uh, air solid waste also need a lot of work still yeah. to be done energy maybe uh, but for now water bodies i think is a huge enough problem that if i can solve only the problem of water bodies in my limited lifetime i'll be more than satisfied <laughs> Yeah. So I'm not really thinking about venturing outwards right now. <laughs> I was just thinking about this, uh, Priyanka. Yeah. Like you know, uh, it's it's hard enough to solve the problem when it's within a country. But think of water blue, water bodies that are shared by countries. Yeah. Like how, how do you bring that collaboration in? Is that even possible? Uh, that's I think one of the major geopolitical problems across the nation. Uh, every country has realized that. Uh, they might run out of water, if not now, maybe in 50 years. And water as a resource need to be kind of grabbed uh, and not let the other country take it. Uh, and many countries right now in the world are fighting over water bodies as we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, rivers in Europe are still 
uh, well shared, well managed. Right. Ching till Egypt. Uh, but for example, Nile. Nile is facing a lot of problems because uh, uh, upstream dams are being built because of it's not enough quantum of water is now uh, reached. This is this is a great, great problem. For example, uh, water and rivers is at the heart of flow from uh, Tibet in the to Kashmir in India and into Pakistan. Anytime India wants, it can put a stranglehold on these rivers. Our problem, like India's problem with Pakistan and China both. So the Indus and its five tributaries and Pakistan would simply have no water. Uh, we like uh, have, uh, and that's why Kashmir is so geopolitically important for Pakistan as well. Went really like the industry, the industry over water. Um, actually, between India and Pakistan has been going on for years, and mm. even at the time of wars and conflicts, it's never, it's never been yeah. uh, broken. Uh, but now I think there is a. The Indian government was looking to renegotiate that treaty. So India and Pakistan are at wars. China has grabbed Tibet because it is the major source of water for a lot of rivers. Uh, Indus, Ganga, Yamuna, Brahmaputra, Mekong, a lot of rivers originate from Tibet. And uh, whoever controls Tibet controls the, their water. China is now looking to make a canal to divert the water from Tibet to mm -hmm. northern China. Oh, uh, and because of which the water that used to flow in downstream countries like Laos, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, etc., would now be reduced. Hmm. And if China holds the key to the water in these rivers, it controls those countries as well. Yeah, and that's why it's become a major geopolitical uh, tug of war, uh, and. It's it, it's at every level. For example, uh, in terms of geographies, for example, over the river Kaveri, Karnataka and Tamil Nadu fight, right? So it's between countries, it's between states, it might become between cities. Yeah. Uh, so these problems need to be kind of broken down into a smaller level. For example, if you want to solve uh, the problem of any river rejuvenation, hmm. let's break it down into smaller pieces. When this river goes from state number one, it originates in state one, it uh, goes to state two, State one has to ensure that this quantum of water and this quality of water would be made available to state two. Mm -hmm. And then break it down to even smaller pieces. When, for example, Khan River, uh, Kanha River goes from Indore to Ujjain district, uh, joins the Shipra River, then which joins uh, Chambal, Gambhir, uh, Yamuna and eventually Ganga, you break it down into district level. Mm -hmm. Whenever this river leaves the district of Indore, the boundaries of Indore, we uh, will give the river to the next district in a clean condition, right? Then it's, so then now the onus is, is on every district or every municipal corporation right. to manage just their geography. And you solve the bigger problem by math, kind of breaking down into pieces. So yeah. that's how I think it should be done. Interesting, very interesting. Is there anything else that... Uh we should be apprehensive about related to water. Like a lot of what you just said sounds very bleak to me already. But is there something that I could do to be better prepared? As an individual, uh, there are certain things that you can do. For okay. example, plant more trees, consume less water, uh, reduce, recycle, reuse. Mm. But the major onus is not on individuals and residential usage, mm. but on the industrial and agricultural usage. Mm. Uh, we need to kind of tra transition to agricultural uh, practices which are far more water, uh, which use uh, far less water. Hmm. And even the industrial processes consume a lot of water. Uh, we've seen thousands of liters are required to make a single uh, pair of jeans. So that demand needs to go down as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think, but what an individual can do uh, what you and me can do right now is to raise awareness. Right. Uh, people aren't really talking about water that much. Right. It's the, like one of the most critical element of survival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Air, water, yeah. right? Uh, if you don't have water or have polluted water, humans would not be able to survive. It's as simple as that. But we're not able to s foresee that or and act in time. We see that 
water is getting scarce right. it's getting polluted mm-hmm. not just the surface water the ground water and everything yet we uh yet it's not a political agenda for us yet it does not matter to us that much because it's been subsidized it's kind of uh, uh, made available to us very freely we just open the, have to open the tap and we have water right so we don't really understand the gravity of the situation in our daily lives uh, and that needs to happen that a conversation and dialogue not, not just from private individuals but businesses and the government as a whole s- needs to start happening so that we reach a conclusion we discuss re- reach conclusions make plans and start executing on the ground because honestly we have very very few years to turn it, turn it around if we kind of keep a sleep for the next 5 to 10 years uh, there would be a major major uh, environmental disaster even if we wake up now right away i think a few environmental disasters are coming our way yeah. nonetheless uh you uh huge floods drought simultaneously just this past year there was this massive drought in china and flood in pakistan at the yeah, same time yeah. uh so very random patterns could be observed for example wildfires in australia would increase this year because of el nino mm-hmm. lesser monsoons in india mean uh water scarcity lesser pro- uh, crop production uh, higher price of these commodities uh higher temperatures maybe we might see uh 1 to 2 degree uh, average temperature higher this year as compared to last year oh my god with lesser rainfall that just aggravates the problem even further so uh that's why we need to kind of start waking up and start preparing for the next year right away yeah. uh this uh, year is going to be bad and uh another problem is this is the election year in india you won't for a few months this year uh, in the coming year you would not really see a lot of work happening because the country is going into elections yeah. and really couldn't be a couldn't couldn't have chosen a worse year to go for elections but mm. let's see that's why uh it's great we're having this conversation so that uh, it raises awareness and people start taking action uh, that's i think the prim- primary agenda Yes, yes. you made it sound bleak priyanshu but you also made it sound very hopeful and mm-hmm. latching on to that hope i'd like to conclude this it was a immense pleasure to have you over here to the studio it was my pleasure anger it was really great speaking with you absolutely you. likewise looking forward to the next episode definitely all right